This episode of the Managing Madrid podcast is brought to you by Blossom Houston Hotel. Positioned at the axis of innovation and inspiration, guests can enjoy the diversity of nearby neighborhoods, world-class dining options, and attractions via a complimentary Mercedes-Benz SUV within a three-mile radius and subject to availability, or you can take the Metro Rail Line, which is conveniently situated right next to the hotel. Listeners, Blossom Hotel Houston. If you're traveling to Houston for the preseason in July, make sure to book your stay at Blossom Hotel Houston. They are also hosting our podcast in Houston on July 27th at 7 p.m. Please come out and meet us if you want to book your spot to the show. Click the link in the show notes, get your tickets, and save $20 if you do it before July 1st. All right? Make sure to go do that ASAP. And coming up is a podcast about Bellingham done through visual analysis and analytics. Let's go. Nice article in the Managing Madrid uh, blog. The wonderful lads that do a great job there. And worth reading about that man there. So he bets the man needs to rest and the numbers reveal why. Hello and welcome to a Wednesday edition of the Managing Major Podcast. I'm your host, Kian Zabani, joined tonight by Mehedi Hassan to talk about Bellingham. Mehedi put out a pretty cool uh, article about Bellingham with the, all the visuals he normally does. And that was a few days ago and great timing because today Bellingham was officially announced. Looks absolutely fantastic in the new kit, by the way. Looking sharp. Great um, new signing for Real Madrid. I'm super excited about Bellingham. I think he's going to be someone to really look forward to for many, many years to come, if all goes according to plan. A phenomenal profile, a unique skill set, a combination jack-of-all-trades midfielder, and I think today's podcast will kind of visualize that a little bit too. So, Mehdi, welcome to the show, man. How are you doing? Hey, Kian. Thanks so much. I'm doing well. Uh, you're right about the kit. The new kit looks fantastic, but my hype about the new kit kind of lowered down a little bit. I don't know if you saw that tweet from Lucas. Someone pointed out that our new kit looks exactly like the LA Galaxy kit. And I'm like, oh, Adidas cost big time. They just like <laughs> took an old <laughs> LA Galaxy paste. kit and put, uh, yeah, and they just they just put our logo on that. How could they do this? I, I, but yeah, it didn't ruin it for me. I looks... I looked up. I didn't. I think I, it's got some LA Galaxy colors, but I don't think. I think it kind of ends yeah. there. I haven't seen a Galaxy the kit. LA that Galaxy colors this. are actually like reversed in ours because in the Galaxy kit the stripes are blue and like the trimmings are gold. Uh, in yeah. ours, like I think it's it's kind of reversed. But the kit looks to me like it it's it looks fantastic now that the players have worn it, and also. Uh, like I wasn't a fan when like the ninety nine they had this like gold blue trimming kits uh, the, the from the season where I think it was ninety nine two thousand from the season where they had that famous black and gold kit it was back I think they're trying to bring some retro stuff back into the mix Adidas so the kit looks great uh, just a before getting on to Bellingham. I just read this on Twitter. I don't know about conspiracy theory. Why Real Madrid delayed Bellingham's announcement and also like kid, new kit announcement. Why Fran Garcia and Brahim Diaz basically got announced in the previous kit. So I saw this on Twitter. I, I don't know if it's true or not that they had actually taken way more Benzema and Asensio pictures for the kit launch and then they got sold <laughs> and then they had to like, redo photo shoots and re-edit. Because like there is a photo where Benzema is like standing right beside Lucas Vasquez. And in the official launch they had to like edit Benzema out. And that that must have taken some pretty good editing time. So <laughs> that was that was kind of funny to me. I, I would not be surprised 
because there was a ton of photos taken with Benzema, and I'm sure he was going to oh. lead the the launch, mm-hmm. like the the marketing for it, right? As the guy mm-hmm. with Vinicius, and uh, you know, so I I'm not surprised. I don't I don't know. I don't know either way. I don't have the answer to that, maybe, but. I'm not. I wouldn't be surprised if that was part of the reason why they decided to delay it. Um, the LA Galaxy parallel doesn't actually ruin it for me. I enjoy the kit. I like it much better than when I initially saw the leak that Footy Headlines always puts in advance. I was kind of like, eh, not a fan. But then when I see the players actually put it on, uh, it looks great. I thought it looked great. And as Lucas pointed out too, it's managing Madrid colors. So two birds oh, with one stone. Yeah. Yeah. Bellingham. By the way, quick shout out to um Luka Modric, the ageless Luka Modric who scored a penalty in extra time to lead Croatia. Also won man of the match uh, honors to lead Croatia into the UEFA Nations League final which they will face either France or sorry, Italy or Spain. That game is happening tomorrow. Just wanted to give a quick shout out to Modric. It wasn't entirely zero news day. You know, we had the kit launch, we had Modric playing, and we had the Bellingham announcement. So it was like relatively eventful. But Bellingham is the man of the hour. Um, I've spoken a lot about him. I also wrote about him. And t- to summarize it in 10 seconds, this guy can do everything in midfield. And I'm super excited for his player profile because I think he really fits into modern football and how it's just moving in this direction of, Midfielders have to do everything. They have to defend. They have to press. They have to uh, be able to dribble. They have to be able to evade pressure. They have to be able to be incisive with their passing, verticality, line breaking. He can do all of that, bring goals from midfield. So I'm really excited for it. Um, what I always like to ask this when I bring on managing with your staff members when it's about an article they've written, what spurred you to write about this topic? Truth to be told, like I have followed Bellingham as everyone almost as much like as a regular fan has uh, watching like uh, Borussia Dortmund highlights. And that was kind of my extent to it, to following Bellingham. I was always excited that, okay, this player, you remember they're thinking of bringing this player on. But I had, I would be lying if I say that I would watch Bundesliga games every week to watch Bellingham. I would be lying if I were to say that so but he is kind of he's not kind of like he's the current next galactico that real Madrid is basically bringing on so i just wanted to do a bit more deep dive on it uh a bit uh you know the volume of data had to be more than just the highlights for me and uh, this kind of analysis i've been doing it like playing around with this stuff like for now a year or two now uh and i got hands on some historical data as well from a couple of seasons ago in Bundesliga. So I combined all that and my uh, basically my approach to this was to that, let's see how this player evolved over time. And that kind of fascinated that he has actually evolved. He has gradually evolved into this beast of a player that he is. And he's still 19. Like he's younger than Kamavinga, <laughs> if you think about that. But he, he looks so mature when he is on the ball. Uh, he's already a leader. Uh, he had at age 19, he has led the Borussia Dortmund team. He was he was the captain for a while as well. Uh, someone in my Madrid Batar podcast asked a question that uh, like when can we expect Bellingham to be the Real Madrid captain? Which like we have to like shut that question down pretty quickly because he's probably going to be the Real Madrid captain for the entirety of his Real Madrid time, but. The leadership is there. We need, uh, since now we have a young core, we have this uh, young player. The, the leadership is also a necessary element of this. So basically, to summarize it, summarize it uh, to see the Bellingham's evolve, how he evolved into the player he is, to look uh, deeply into that, that's why I you know, thought about that and wrote it. The leadership aspect is why I, in part, compared him to Kamavinga because... Everything about Kamavinga we know from his youth team coaches all the way from when he was a kid to even a little bit further along the the developmental chart when he was 19. Um, like everything up until now, 
think he's still 19, is he not? Is he here? Did he turn 20 yet? Yeah, he, he no, he's he's 19. 19. <laughs> so if you think about like everything yeah. all his youth team coaches have said about him, and then you fast forward over the years, every at like at every level, whether it was Ren, whether it was different levels of the French national team, the youth levels, um, Everyone has said he's way ahead of his age. Like you can't put him at his age level because he just dominates. You have to put him higher up. He understands the game at a higher level. He's better. He's technically more gifted than his peers. And he's also physically ahead of his peers. And that's followed him. Like, you know, some players kind of just eventually that development stalls, but then you fast forward and this is the same narrative about Kamavinga now. It's, you know, in the Champions League, semifinals, quarterfinals, um, round of 16, he's coming off the bench, changing the game against some of the best players in the world. He's starting at left back in a World Cup final, which is insane for a teenager to be playing out of position and having to defend Lionel Messi. He's that maturity has, you know, been something that Real Madrid, I think, have circled when they're scouting these players. They have something in common, whether it's Chu, Many, Kamavinga, or Bellingham, they have a lot of similar attributes. And, um, I think you see that in Bellingham too, with the way he's led as such a young player, both Dortmund and also such an important player in the English national team. It's really incredible to see at that age what he's doing. So how this podcast is going to work, Mahidi, um, and listeners, I'm going to share my screen. So if you're following on YouTube, you can actually look at Mahidi's visuals here on the screen. And we're going to go through them. So it's divided up into progressive carries, passing, pass receptions, dribbling those four categories and we're going to share our screen Mahedi's going to kind of walk us through the visuals and and uh give us his analysis so i'm going to go ahead and share my screen here if you're on youtube great if you're on the podcast app don't worry it's still going to be Mahedi is such a great storyteller that you won't even know you can just basically close your eyes and picture all the visuals that Mahedi has drawn up <laughs> so progressive carries Mahedi. i think this is interesting because you've broken it down over three years 2020 2021 season and the two years after that talk about his evolution and the the change in his role yeah so the first season he obviously like played uh, a lot fewer minutes uh, and he played uh, around like 1700 minutes in his first season in Bundesliga then it uh, you know worked up to more than 2500 minutes in the two seasons after that so the volume, the change of volume is kind of expected there. But even if you see from the first, uh, from the leftmost uh, diagram here that his progressive carries were mostly through the middle and not really, you know, the final third oriented. So they didn't really see him as a attacking presence at the very beginning at Dortmund. But fast forward one year later in, in the 21-22 season, you'd see that, a lot of his carries are, uh, you know, ending very deep in the, in the final third. The volume is still very high in the middle of the pitch in the mid third, but you can see that it kind of increases in the final third as well. But in the second season, it mostly it's on the final, final third, at least it's mostly focused on the left wing. But when you change it to the current season, you'd see that it's kind of, uh, it has even out over the two flanks. So I another thing that I kept in mind while writing this article is that how does this translate into a Real Madrid player? So Real Madrid can really use some of that final third presence, especially on the right, uh, and for some of that line break ability, especially on the right, because our right side is, is just patch or after patch after patch after patch for so many years now. Since Bell, you know, Bell's health started to fail, that's how right wing has been. So if we have someone with that kind of capability who can drive the ball forward in both flanks like that, and as well as down the middle, that is a huge asset. So Bellingham, when he started at Dortmund, was this player who wasn't really given a final third role to begin with. Then his role evolves into this final third presence who mostly focuses on the left. And now in last, in last season, the season that just concluded, he was you know, kind of the chief initiator of everything uh, in terms of driving the ball forward and, uh, you know, breaking lines for Dortmund. So this is how his progressive carry basically evolved over the time. 
you can also see how much he loves spending his time in the opposing half. Um, but also so dangerous carrying the ball from deeper positions. How much do you, and this is putting you on the spot here, but I don't know if you've ever done a chart like this for Rodrigo. How much do you uh, see patterns like this with Rodrigo with in terms of him carrying the ball down the middle and either flank? Uh, I haven't done something like that for Rodrigo, but it's not really difficult to do because right now I have Real Madrid data from the 2009 season to present day. Any player, any match of La Liga, you can name it uh, from like Fernando Gago to Vinicius. I can make this. Uh, it it took took some time to collaborate all the data together, but uh. Yeah, I have that. And it's an interesting point that you bring up that how much Rodrigo's progressive carries would look like. I, I myself would be interested to see that and probably bring it up in a in a future article. But yeah, the Rodrigo point is is intriguing. Well, Camavinga and Fede Valverde too, for that matter. It'd be interesting to see. Yeah, yeah. I think part of the reason we bring this up too is that in pretty much all the categories that Bellingham's good at, which is virtually everything, um, you can kind of go down the list and, and say that there are parallels. Again, Camavinga is an elite ball carrier. Same with Fede Valverde. Mm-hmm. And so you have similar profiles in midfield beating, being stacked together. Uh, anything else on the on mm-hmm. the carries? No, no, no. Do you see Cam- uh, Bellingham's profile at Real Madrid being more similar to this one here on the right? 2020 to 2023 season uh, where it seems like he's everywhere? Uh, I think it would be, like, especially under Ancelotti, I think it would be even more liberated. <clears throat> and uh, once we go and... What what he did for growing in 22-23, yes, that is a possibility. But me personally, I think his profile would be more aligned with the on in 21-22 and I'll, I'll tell the reason why when we discuss his passes. Okay. So let's move on to his passes then. So uh, you've done the similar thing here. Really, really mm-hmm. nice visuals, by the way. Aesthetically very pleasing to, to look at. Um, so Thank let's you. go through this one. Progressive passes. Yeah. So the progressive passes are in gold. The regular passes in, are in sky blue or light blue, whatever they are. Again, the volume was really low in the first season because he played less. In the last two seasons, the volume increased a lot. So as you can see, in 21-22, in 21-22, his, his lot of passes were focused in the defensive third, the left side. Uh, there was ball progression. There was you know a decent amount of ball progression. But come 22-23, I'm pretty sure if I make the same chart for Tony Cruz, it would look similar. Uh, Cruz has obviously like played way more passes than him, but I'm pretty sure it'll look kind of similar. And that is why I say that his profile would probably fit more as like the left-sided midfielder or the eight. So if you combine his progressive carries of 21-22 and combine that with his progressive passing of 22-23, I think that is the ideal real Madrid player. Why I say this is if you pair Fran Garcia, Vinicius Jr., and Jude Bellingham on that left half space, that is that is like utter chaos. That is like I'm I'm salivating even like thinking about it. So uh that that would really work because and why I say this, you see, all these passes progressive passes prayed from the left to right that is that is what tony cruz does when he when there is nothing to play on the left when it's uh, it's a matter of quick switch a quick long switch cruz does that so well and that is how our team's ball progression patterns have been built up over the years that cruz has been here so if if we want to want to do a you know plug and play replacement here only for the aspect of those those kind of switches we can do that with bellingham in addition with more chaos or walk we wreck on the left half space or, or on that left flank with Vinicius and Fran Garcia flying over. So 
I think, yeah, the ideal Bellingham right now, there are a lot of versions of Bellingham. Uh, my ideal Bellingham would be a ball carrier of 21-22 and the aggressive passer of 22-23. Uh, What's interesting about this Mehdi too is that <clears throat> you look at the evolution of these three years in all these charts and he's grown an influence in the team with each passing season despite, and it's not because he's playing more. He's actually had more, less minutes this season than he did in the previous two seasons. And, uh, but his touches are up despite playing less and his goal creating actions are way up despite playing a little bit less. Some of this is health related. It's not, he's not playing less because he's, you know, so his usage has gone up. And it's not because he's playing more. It's just because he's better. He's growing. He's evolving. And uh, that's a great sign to me. There has not been regression yet. It's just been, the trajectory has just been going north. So, um, yeah, it's pretty cool to see that evolution. Um, I think part of the part of the reason why it might be difficult to see him um, play on the left side more is because we have Vinicius and Cruz on that left side. So I think naturally he may have to drift more to the right or central channels. Um, but I would not be surprised if he overloaded the left side quite a bit too. So the second chart also under the passing category, this is his passes into the, the half spaces, right? And zone 14. Yeah. So, so all this three is, of those zones. Yeah. yeah. So zone 14 and half space passes. And on this one, again, with time, uh, volume increased. Uh, for the last the most recently concluded season, you can see that the zone 14 involvement was a little less because Dortmund's play style kind of became more uh, flank oriented. So he had to like, uh, you know, spray his passes along the flanks more, but uh, he's a constant presence. What, 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 in, what's interesting here is you see his presence with passes on both half spaces, almost uniform. There is probably like 1920s, but, it's it's almost uniform, and that excites me because in our style of play, we need a player who can like create threats on both flanks. Uh, with Real Madrid style, we can get predictable very early in the game, and then we never like rectify that until the 70th minute. Sometimes during the whole 90 minutes, the element of surprise, the element of unpredictability, is is get crucial at the moment and kind of lack that. So if we have someone who can be uh, handy with uh, these kind of dangerous passes on both flanks, that is definitely a huge asset. So pass receptions, and you kind of, this this is great because this tells us where he's moving off the ball, where he's looking to receive as an outlet. Mm. And uh, this is, you know, this is also interesting because it kind of varies year to year. And in 21-22, it's a very left-heavy. The year before, more on the right. Mm -hmm. Maybe in 22-23, you're seeing a more balanced outlook. So explain this one. Yeah, so this is this is great to look for a reason that this means this guy is not bound by one side of the pitch. Uh, his coaches has trusted him with you know, receiving the ball on the right, on the left, and pretty much everywhere on the pitch. So, uh, a, probably a, a parallel to Modric could be drawn here. Modric is a, that kind of a presence for us. He has been for so long mm -hmm. that he can be trusted to receive the ball very deep on the left, on the right, and then, uh, you know, progress with it. Uh, so, yeah, that, that, again, fascinated me that this guy has been entrusted regardless of, you know, uh, side can basically play anywhere on the pitch as as you mentioned at the beginning of the podcast. This is great because I'm thinking about all the games in the past year or two where we've needed movement between the lines. We needed someone to just declutter the defensive lines that the barricades and we just needed better movement in so many different games and this pro this kind of profile helps me Hedy. Uh last but not least Dribbling, line breaking. He has the most successful take ons in the Bundesliga this past season. Number one, great dribbler. Talk about the variation and the evolution of this over the past three years. 
Uh, yeah. So at the time of writing this, Bellingham was the fourth best dribbler in all of Europe this season, behind Vinicius Jr., Lionel Messi, Jeremy Doku. Uh, by the last game week, uh, Kanging Lee from Mallorca overtook him, and I think Kanging Lee today got signed by PSG. So I saw yeah, that. Yeah, he is taking like. Yeah, He's shout out to music. PSG and signing the... some, just replacing uh, Messi, Neymar, and <laughs> Mbappe with Asensio, <laughs> Hanging Lee. Great job, Good yeah, job, guys. Great job. I uh, like Hanging Lee. He's a good so, player. Yeah. Just to make that clear. Yeah, and and sh- shout out to him that like he's he's one of the top five dribblers in the world. Like he probably didn't get as much hype because he was in Orca, but he he is a great player. Uh, and he, he, he wasn't he at Valencia at some point, and he was like really crazy. He, like he used to like kick people. He kicked the shit out of people. Yeah, that's the one thing I hated about yeah, him. Yeah, you know, I was always scared for our <laughs> players getting injured when we were playing against him. Yeah. So now the fact of the matter is that Bellingham is the only true midfielder of the top five players, with the most successful dribbles in mm. Europe this season. And that is, again, like, that is so, so very crucial for us. That is probably not for other teams, but for us, that is so very crucial because La Liga is getting more notorious each day for the amount of low blocks that we have to face week in, week out. And sometimes you just have to dribble through. And I, I know it, it's like a cliche that Vinicius has to dribble through like 800 defenders every day. It helps when someone like Bellingham is all... Also, there it opens space up for other people. If you can like you know, attach defenders to you like that while you're dribbling, so huge asset in that regard. We lacked that kind of a presence in the midfield because Cruz is not like a dribbler like Vinicius or Bellingham. Neither is Modric, especially like in his later years. He probably was, uh, you know, be- a better dribbler in his younger years. Uh, Fede Valverde, he's he he drives with the ball. He's, he he has great speed and all, but he's not like technically a dribbler, dribbler. So having that kind of a presence in the midfield was really necessary, and now we have it. I'm thinking of the different scenarios that the dribbling is going to be helpful. One is like the low blocks. You need someone unpredictable. You need someone to go at defensive lines, knock down, knock knock them down with line breaking dribbling. Then there's just the the terrifying transition counterattacks you could do with Bellingham, just carrying the ball up the field, blitzing past one or two defenders, connecting with Vinicius. There are there's many scenarios where um, Bellingham's dribbling is going to be really fun to watch. So, what's great about this is that it's a visual presentation of where he spends his time on the field, what zones what he does, um, how versatile he is on and off the ball, his movement, his intelligence. Uh, and I think it's, it's really clear. I mean, you didn't get much into the defensive side of this. In my article, I had also noted that, and this this part's out of time I have, I think it was only four players who committed more tackles than him and only four or five players who blocked more shots than him. So in terms of just the ground he covers and the defense that he brings, in addition to mm-hmm. what he does offensively is, is really exciting. Mehdi, any concluding thoughts on Jude Bellingham? Yeah, I think this this transfer has a lot of flares in terms of business. We just discussed Real Madrid's shirt, shirt sales. I don't know what number he's going to pick. He loves the 22 because he has been wearing that since his Birmingham days. And... Uh, by the way, like some of his, because he wears 22 and some of his like running style, his uh, dribbling style really resembles Isco. So whenever I used to like watch in you know, highlights of Bellingham, because of the shirt and everything, full sleeve, he wears full sleeve. It 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 looked kind of like Isco in, in a lot of, you know, closed spaces. So uh, the 22 currently belongs to Rudiger. I, I don't think he, he really likes the number two, but he's got two two on his back now, so I don't think he's going to give it up. The other option is probably taking uh, five off of Vallejo and giving that to him because Bellingham is a Zidane fan. And the other number currently empty is Casemiro and Javi Alonso's 
legendary 14. Mm. Well, those are like legendary real midfielders as well. They might give that to him. Uh, so yeah, shirt, he, his shirt's going to sell a lot. A friend was pointing to me that Real Madrid now will get a lot of English supporters. Like Real Madrid will get get a lot of English eyes watching Real Madrid now. So the because of Bellingham. So the outrageous takes that we usually hear before the Champions League nights that Karim Benzema has finally reached the level of Harry Kane, like Michael Richard said last year. We, we, that would probably tone down a little bit now. Now because of Bellingham, there will be more eyes from the Premier League on. On Real Madrid, will uh, there? And all in all, this was a statement. I'm skeptical. Uh, will well, we still? Will they actually uh, watch now? <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm, I'm probably like, uh, well, it's. I'm usually very, very real optimistic about this thing, but yeah, I think they'll watch even to like envy us more. They will, they will watch. It's uh, uh it's so, just wait, like he, let's say like when he's 29 or 30 years old. He's going to like yeah. sign for a Premier League team. He's going to finally leave Real Madrid in like ten yeah. years, and they're going to be like, "We didn't know he was this good." Real Madrid, we're holding yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or or we'll hear takes like this, like that. Uh, yeah, Bellingham compared to Mason Mount or something like that. Uh, this was a statement signing. I I tweeted this when like Dortmund signed him that Real Madrid still have that allure of Real Madrid. Uh, that is why we were able to sign Aurelien Chouamini despite Kian Mbappe pushing for forcing him to sign for PSG at that time. Uh, we signed Kavinga on deadline deadline day. We signed Bellingham, who is a British player and the Premier League, like the how Diego calls it the Super Premier League. Uh, so we signed up kind of signed up you know player that Super Premier League year after so this is kind of a real Madrid statement signing but these signings will you know get even fewer in numbers in the future with all the money that coming in like as I said like for every Kamavinga there's an Mbappe who chose the better better monetary offer for every Chuameni or like for every Bellingham there is a Haaland who chose a different sporting project but the allure of Real Madrid, the the call of Real Madrid, the train of Real Madrid is still pretty appealing to players, uh, young players, and it's good to see that Real Madrid are uh, able to make this statement signing. What I would like to, uh, you know, cut it off by saying is that, like, I'm one of those fans who very ra- rarely is optimistic and like, uh, pr- you know, praising our team. I'm more, always on the pessimistic side. I'm I'm one of the quote unquote one of those. But in recent times, even like listening a lot of managing Madrid podcast, I was almost going to say managing Modric podcast for some reason. But uh, if they, that could be an episode managing Modric. But uh, Sid said a lot of things about Real Madrid's recruit recently, and I, and I wholeheartedly agree. I think the c- recruitment is something that we really have to take our hat off there are some discrepancies like we still don't have a right back and we haven't filled certain gaps uh, in certain times but how they have invested in youth and how they have come off of Vinicius, Rodrigo, Chuami, Kamaviga, Fede, now Bellingham that is praiseworthy so uh, well as I just said that like I'm, I'm I hardly get optimistic about those this thing I'm usually pessimistic and I was talking about the right back while I was praising the team for something else. But uh, I'm happy that Real Madrid are signing these players and uh, may this trend continue with even like bigger things. Yeah, look, it, this is a great sign. Look, we've, we've, we've had misses, man, but, uh, you know, the, the past several signings, I think, have been have been great. I mean, we've had a lot of good signings in the last few years, despite not doing enough in the market, I think it could be argued to upgrade certain positions, but you know, Kamavinga was a great signing. I think too many will prove to be a great signing. I think mm-hmm. Bellingham's a great signing. Uh, I think I mentioned this to Matt last night that we're like one signing away from having a great summer. Yeah. If you think about Fran Garcia coming back, Bellingham coming back, Bellingham arriving. Yeah. Um Brian Diaz is okay. Like, you know, I'm not too excited about him, but, you know, you need the depth to replace somebody <laughs> like Asensio, right? So it's moving yeah. in the right direction. You need people like that. If they get, like, the one striker, I think this is a great window. And uh, yeah. and then ho- yeah. hopefully by 2025, you get a right back. 
<laughs> at the very latest. Yeah, ho- right hopefully back, whenever well. whenever Ashraf Hakimi's contract ends up at PSG. <laughs> when does his contract end? Is it twenty twenty five? I think it's twenty twenty six, and uh, yeah, I don't know when, when he wants to leave. Probably the president of UN will call him. Uh, and I don't know what what shenanigans they're gonna do him do with him when he wants want to leave. Who knows? Um, I I don't trust PSG to do anything for anybody. So yeah, I don't know what <laughs> what PSG are gonna look like in a couple of years. But uh, yeah, I'll just leave it there. I <laughs> I almost almost <laughs> almost brought up the man. I don't you know the man who shall be yeah yeah. In, yeah, we're going to go into a whole now, spiral issue. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no need to get into that now. We have several years to discuss to discuss that never-ending saga. Mehdi, excellent work. Everyone should go read Mehdi's article on Jude Bellingham and plenty of analysis on the site. As usual, go check it out. Thanks, buddy. It was a pleasure having you on. Thank you. Thanks, Ken. Take care. All right, thanks for listening, guys. And before we sign off here, we wanted to give a quick shout out to our patrons over on patreon.com slash managing Madrid. It's been an absolute honor getting to know you guys and seeing this Real Madrid family grow. And you guys are a big part of it. And we wanted to thank you. And we also wanted to give a shout out to our $10 plus patrons specifically because if you pledge $10 or more, not only do you get access to our entire back catalog, plus guaranteed responses to all of your questions, but you also get a specific shout out on the podcast. So shout out to these $10 plus patrons as follows. Brandon Alvarez, Willie Reed, Will Sousa, Wei Pering, Wamik Jamal, Tobias Royo Bacher, Tahmid Kalam, Sushank Demala, Sujai Wani, Sumanchu Singh, Sheikh Hatiri, Sergio Arisbe, Santos Solorzano, Samuli Justin, Samer Z, Sai Mohan, Sasi Kumar, Rodrigo Balmaceda, Rishi D, Phoenix, Peter Powell, Paulo Fierro, Patrick Diafari, Oscar Barrera, Omar Barawani, Nico Laxo, Nicholas Moller, Nick Ribeiro, Nelson Masariego, Naveen Babu, Ramesh Babu, Mowgli, uh, MJ Diego, Michael Zinberg, Marin Myrtle, Matthew Atkins, Martin Ridman, Magnus Lext, Logan Stahl, Leon Stavernakis, Kunal Tilakar, Crystal Glass, Kevin Rivera, Jose Osorio, John Fernandez, Jeff Soa, Jason Fitz, Jacob P., Ian Marley, Howard Moore, Graham Gerard, Gary Cohut, Frederick Rantakiro, Frederick Sundros, S.A. Davisito, Ernesto Gutierrez Vargas, Eloy Enriquez, Edward Sossman, Daniel Williams, Connor McMorrow, Christian Toff, Christian Acosta, Brennan Powers, Brandon Stevens, Arnab Mukherjee, Armand Gashi, Armando L, Anthony Tharp, Anirudh Singh, Andres Silvestre, Ananya Kumar, Alex Steiberg, Azaz Hussein, Adrian Rios, Adar Zalukovic, Adam Dorsey, Bella Chow, Varun, Ramtin Magrur, Fabian Moreno, and Daniel Smith. You guys rock. Thank you so much. And Halamarikum.